I think we can start. Thanks everyone for joining. Today, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Arash Ojudani. He is the Director of Human-Robot Interface and Interaction Labor Laboratory at IIT. He also coordinates the Robotics for Manufacturing Lab of the Leonardo Labs, and he is the Principal Investigator of the IIT Intel Mac Joint Lab. He received his PhD degree in Robotics and Automation from University of Pisa and IIT in 2014 and he is the recipient of the ERC Starting Grant 2019, Ergo Lean. The coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project, Sofia, co-coordinator of the Horizon 2020 project, Concert, and principal investigator of the Horizon MSCA project, uh, RICAM. He is the recipient of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society, Early Career Award in 2021 and winner of the Amazon Research Awards 2019, of the Solution Award 2019, of the Cook Innovation Award 2018, of the WebRob Best Poster Award 2018, and the Best Student Paper Award at Robio 2013. His PhD thesis was finalist for the George's Gerald PhD Award 2015, Best European PhD Thesis in Robotics, he was also a finalist for the Best Paper Award on Mobile Manipulation at IROS 2022, Best Paper Award at Humanoids 2022, the Solution Award 2020, Best Conference Paper Award at Humanoids 2018, Best Interactive Paper Award at Humanoids 2016, Best Oral Presentation Award at the Automatica in 2014, and for the Best Manipulation Paper Award at ICRA 2012. He's the author of the book, Transferring Human Impedance Regulation Skills to Robots in the Springer Tractats in Advanced Robotics and several publications in journals and international conferences. He's currently serving as an elected IEEE RAS at the COM member and as a chair and representative of the IEEE RAS Young Professional Committee. He has been serving as a member of a scientific advisory committee and as an associate editor for several international journals and conferences such as IEEE RAL, ICRA, IROS, ICOR, and so on. He is a scholar of the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems, and his main research interests are in physical human-robot interaction, mobile manipulation, robust and adaptive control, assistive robotics, and telerobotics. So I guess with no further ado, we're very looking forward to hearing what you are going to tell us today. All right. Thank you very much, Emilio. It's probably the, the most complete introduction I've ever had for a talk. Thank you very much also for uh, inviting me for this talk. I will try to give an overview of some of the works related to learning and control for interactive robots. So um, without any, any more introduction, I just want to cite um, um, basically, this, this sentence that I always believe in it, uh, which says all models are wrong, but some are useful. Of course, um, I am uh, mostly from um, traditional model-based um, robotics background, but we are also work working on, on a lot of learning approaches. Um, uh, obviously, when it comes to human-robot interaction, you can imagine a scenario like this. Um, you cannot rely on either one of them 100%, and you need to combine both model-based and, and AI and learning-based techniques together to be to be able to achieve a really good performance, right? So many of the components that come together, for instance, for perception, we have really good, reliable machine learning-based techniques for control. We need to be robust in terms of manipulation. Then you can rely on, on, on basically control techniques, model-based control techniques, and improve their performance through learning. This will be the topic of my talk that... Um, how learning and control elements can come together in human robot interaction in general. So if you want to decompose the interaction, the let's say the components of human robot interaction, uh, we are dealing with the human side of the problem and the robotics and let's say side of the problem. On the human side of the problem, we are dealing with physical factors and cognitive factors that basically define the states of the human that interact with the external world and the robot. On the robotic side of the problem, we have robotic assistance and interfaces and control. So let's start one by one. I will tell you a little bit more details about how things come together. Um, in terms of physical human analysis, we have a model-based approach, eventually also combined with, uh, with, with machine learning. I will tell you how, 
how we are modeling human uh, physical interaction behavior. So um, to, to have a, let's say, a, a, a reduced complexity approach, we are modeling humans like humanoid robots. So basically, as you know, the floating base dynamics of interaction between a humanoid robot uh, or a human-like robot is defined by this with uh, with uh, with all the let's say high um, with nonlinear terms, gravitational joint torques, and external uh, forces acting on the body. So when there are no interactions between the human and the external world, you can actually uh, sum up these. You have the gravitational elements and only interaction points that you have with the external world are the ground reaction forces, right? Then when you start interacting with the external world, then you have forces acting on certain body parts. The center of pressure moves in the space, and then you still have the ground reaction forces, of course, applied at, up to certain, let's say, point of the support polygon. So when you have these two components, and if you subtract them, what you, what you have is really a nice representation of the effect of, we call it overloading, the effect of load anywhere applied on the body on your joints. Then through this formulation, you get rid of nonlinear elements, you get rid of gravity elements because it's it's the same for with and without external loads. And you can have a really good closed loop, let's say equation that tells you, you tell me what is the external load, you give me the posture of the person and I will tell you how much loading you're applying to different joints. Why is it it's really, it's really important because then you can actually tell how much loading is applied to the person and you can change robot behaviors to, to, to arrive to that point. So just to give you a little bit of a uh, small amount of details on that. So we are um, uh, measuring uh, in this formula, you see that basically we need to understand what is the uh, Jacobian of the center of pressure of the person. And we usually model the human center of mass and center of pressure using the SCSC, which is a statistically equivalent serial chain method that basically projects the center of mass on the support polygon and tells you where the center of pressure of the person is. So if you're interested, we, we will tell you uh, in through some publications how, how uh, we are using this to, to understand where the center of pressure of the person is and basically calculate the Jacobian of the center of pressure. Um, obviously, we have extended this also because when you're dealing with the external loads, the center of pressure displaces and the dynamic displacement of the center of pressure also depends on how you're accelerating the center of mass, uh, how the movement looks like and how the external mass is. And we extended this formulation to, let's say, a, a, a dynamic movement. When it comes to real-time estimation of these parameters, you can actually, instead of offline identifying, identifying these parameters, you can, you can look into uh, let's say um, uh, online techniques like as uh, common filter estimation that you can uh, build your your matrices um, and to be able to identify those parameters in real time. So this is basically the structure that I'm not going to present in details, but just to tell you, you can put a person uh, on a force plate, measure the postures, provide some suggestions, which basically maximizes, uh, minimize the need for postures to identify the parameters, and, and when the person follows those postures, postures you're, you're measuring the whole body center of pressure and you're identifying once and for all this, uh, the, the, the parameters of the, of the person dynamic model. And then when you have those models, you can calculate overloading torques, which means that if the person is interacting with the environment, for instance, the person is picking this large box, uh, you can understand how the torques are varying the overloading torques are varying across the joints. In shoulder is high, in elbow is different, different, and and you can in real time estimate how these torques are varying. When it comes to robotics part, I will tell you how we are using this information to actually reduce the amount of uh, loading which is induced by the by the by the load. So um, we sometimes in in in, in human interaction or human robot interaction um, have this pre, pre assumption of interaction between the human and the world is done through the hand, but this is not mostly the case. Sometimes you're holding the objects with your elbow or sometimes the contact is somewhere else in the body. So um, um, we wanted to understand if we can identify when, where the application of force is on the body. And we started from the definition of torque equilibrium condition. This paper is available. You can actually have a look at it by looking at basically multiplication of the forces with and uh, without let's say external, external forces, we can understand where this point of contact is. And of course, sometimes when you're dealing with the, such postures, you can have uh, the contact between the elbow and also the, the knee uh, or different parts of the body when you actually 
through time, you can actually build a probabilistic approach telling that I can identify the link which is in contact uh, and um, increase the probability of having that list link in contact by just looking um, it's it's in, in, let's say across time how how this is working. But to tell you how it is basically the idea, we can see there are different contacts, and um, we are looking into um, the basically increasing the probability of which link is is being the the link that we we want to uh, the point of contact. And here you can see that we identified it is somewhere in the uh, in the, let's say, a forearm, and here is basically the hand. When you're making sure that this is the point of contact, then you can increase, you can basically calculate the overloading joint charts, right? So um, still going on with the physical factors of the humans, uh, of course, um, overloading joint torques are one of the elements we are looking also in the compressive forces. And the compressive forces in humans is something very similar to internal uh, forces in robotics. So basically when you're applying a force, uh, at cer certain body configuration, you will see that you can easily calculate the internal forces which do not create any movement, just basically press, compress forces from different, uh, let's say, uh, parts of the body joint. You can actually consider that as well. Um, we um, started our model with uh, with a rigid body approach. So we, we modeled human uh, considering, uh, let's say, rigid body links. But of course, this is kind of, uh, an overestimation, especially for certain joints like uh, uh, like the spinal cord, because we know that this is flexible and and cannot be really estimated through a rigid body link. So instead of uh, having an anatomical approach to um, model one by one how these elements interact, because this will add to to certain complexity in computation, we added we we model this like a flexible beam, and we identify this flexible beam very nicely that you can actually. Uh, add this flexible beam instead of a rigid link so you can actually know how the compressive forces or overloading torques are varying across the the the, the back of the of the user um this was basically uh quite interesting because we were able to increase the accuracy of estimation also for the lower back in different let's say emg levels or basically different configurations or or uh, different uh, uh, let's say values of external mode so the second topic I wanted to talk, of course, comes to cognitive factors on humans before we go towards robotics and, and control. So <clears throat> as you know, for cognitive load, most of the time, people look into um, biological signals like EEGs, they get uh, heart rate variability and stuff like that. But these are not very, uh, let's say, user-friendly in a sense that in factories, you cannot really attach EEG sensors or <clears throat> sorry, um, e uh, electrocardiomyography sensors, which are not very reliable. So instead, what we do, we are looking at people's postures. There are so many elements that, that tell you uh, if you're um, losing attention or if you have some certain level of stress different from your normal state. So we, are, we have defined everything only based on vision. By looking at body posture and facial features, we are looking into concentration lo loss and so many other elements and some hyperactivity elements like face or self touching and movements of the body, let's say uh, movements um, when, when you, for instance, you move rapidly your knee, it can be uh, a, an indication of stress. Collecting all together, you can actually understand how um, the stress and cognitive load of the person is changing. In one particular case, you can see um, by looking at uh, where the person is looking, you can, you can identify where the attention of the person is. You can know if the person is looking at a certain screen or is looking away uh, by adjusting where the attention of the person is. You can understand if the person is, um, is thinking or have some level of, uh, let's say, um, cognitive stress. Um, this can be also used for facial feature tracking, like if the person is yawning, sleeping, or to detect sleepy movements, sleepy, let's say, uh, state of the, of the body. At the same time, um, in, in, in basically um, psychology, self-touching, face-touching is connected to, uh, let's say, some sort of um, higher cognitive load. You can, you can capture those with the cameras or other hyperactivities like uh, fast movements uh, um, that are caused by confusion or hyper, high, high stress. You can, you can capture them using uh, whole body and facial recognition um, uh, AI models that we have developed. 
putting everything together in an industrial assembling task, you can actually uh, blend all the information and merge them to create an indication of mental effort and stress levels. When we um, built these models, of course, we tested with the uh, biological signals. Here you can see there's a bracelet that gives uh, a galvanic skin response uh, variations to, to cross match with what we are getting and the uh, identification of those elements were very close to each other and we had a very good estimation. When it comes to robotic assistance, we've been working a lot on the creation of um, robots that basically, especially mobile robots that um, they can interact with people. On, in this video, you see our MOCA, which stands for Mobile Collaborative Robot Assistant. That's through torque control. And this is our skin that we developed. We put around the robot. Uh, most of you know that the mobile bases are blind uh, to, to, to touch. Um, because we are mostly velocity controlled, but we have developed this skin that lets you to interact with the robot in, let's say, at, at points, uh, not only the arm, but also the base. Uh, this can be really nice because, if, for instance, if you're um, not able to see someone through your LiDAR or uh, any plan, the planner gives you bad estimation of the planning, so you can actually avoid any collisions. So the skin we, we use is... Um, uh, the early version of that is based on elevating capacitive tactile sensors. We built them, calibrate them, and put them around around the robot. We built our ROS communication interface to be able to communicate with the with the with the whole system, and we built our whole body controller at the base and arm level in both whole body admissions and, and, and impedance control. If you're interested, the paper is published in RAL. You can actually follow and see by projecting um, the the force interaction forces in the, let's say, to, to create movements in admittance behavior on an impedance controller, basically to create some non-space behaviors. Um, both controllers are implemented uh, at at a whole body level. Um, so when um, the robotic assistant is, is interactive and you have a set of sensors to understand where, where the person is, the vision sensors you have, uh, we have uh, LiDAR sensors that gives us 360 degrees of, um, let's say, point clouds. We have vision sensors, RGBD images we can capture, and we have also touch and torque sensing both at arm and base, so we can actually understand when, when the interaction is happening. So when you want to put all these elements together, especially when you want to bring, for instance, the physical factors, uh, as I told you, uh, you can uh, estimate the overloading torques, when, uh, when the person is interacting with the external world, when uh, you can identify if certain joints are, are changing or having higher torques, you can change the behavior of the robot and, and minimize those, let's say, torques. One uh, simple, item, let's say, example will be this. Um, the robot, for instance, is moving uh, towards a handover posture, which minimizes the uh, um, the basically the effect of um, compressive and, and overloading torques on the person. And then eventually, since we have a multi-objective, multi-constraint optimization, if the person um, wants to perform some sort of manipulation, for instance, drilling, uh, to not only to adding, minimizing the torques uh, to the joints to, of this drill, which is two kilograms, we can actually add uh, the, in the optimization and uh, the force constraints, such as force manipulability or similar, that you can uh, create some sort of um, optimality with respect to overloading torques and force creation and etc. When it comes to cognitive factors, you can pretty much do the same thing. For instance, by looking at the, uh, any method that you can collect to, to process the co cognitive load and stress, you can change robot behaviors in a way that you can um, for instance, create a Pareto uh, optimal front, let's say, um, uh, optimality, let's say, um, curve that uh, in one axis you can push on the execution speed, like um, uh, like basically um, how fast the robot is supposed to perform the job. But on the other axis, you can minimize jerk that contributes to relaxation and more, let's say, less cognitive load on the person. And obviously, depending on the state of the person, you can always move across this Pareto optimal front um, based on real-time observation of the human, which comes from the stress tracking. So if you're more stressed, less, if you're more stressed, you can move to minimizing jerk. But if you're in a, in a rest phase, you can move more and faster to to um, maximize basically productivity. This is one example that you can see. Uh, the robot starts um, 
work, collaborating with the person in co-packaging and detects rest phase and pushes on the productivity, let's say increases the velocity. And at some point it will capture le some level of um, stress, let's call it, which is above a certain threshold. And then this basically lagging behind the robot calibrates and brings back the, the, the velocity of the execution to a point which thinks that this is um, more optimal and more calibrated and personalized to the person's, let's say, um, uh, that current state of the of the of the task uh, execution. And this uh, we did on more than ten participants, and and we analyzed their let's say cognitive load and also uh, the execution speed. And we believe that this can create some customized, some personalizable uh, solution for human robot interaction. Um, so these are basically uh, some works that I introduced you in, in bringing, um, let's say, human um, physical and cognitive models in human-robot interaction. But now I want to uh, introduce um, a, a more of a hybrid approach that you can bring um, high, basically learning and optimization, like model-based optimization for mobile robots for really contact-rich tasks. So when it comes to mobile manipulation, most of the time you are uh, we are dealing with high-level planning of locomotion and manipulation and low-level control. So most of the time, low-level control, we have really good and reliable techniques such as passivity-based impedance controllers or interaction controllers in general. But we always, um, most of the time, we don't know how to plan our robots, how to plan trajectories, how to plan impedance behavior, especially when it comes to contact-rich tasks. So we kind of divided this to two to a hybrid approach by making sure that the control is done by reliable, robust controllers, while the, 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 the learning is taking care of them, let's say the more of a task planning. So the idea was uh, for like a for a contact reach task like polishing or drilling and stuff like that, to use this system to create, let's say, behaviors, um, both trajectories and, and 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 desired forces that you would like to have. And through some optimization, actually, you can make sure that the robot is creating the, the desired stiffness behavior in contact that you can track those desired trajectories and forces. So the point is that the tracking of the human stiffness is not easy. You either do it through stiff through EMG mapping or some very simplified methods that is not easy, it's not easy to, to, to be done or modeled. So we created a, a technique to basically kind of detour this problem to identify the best stiffness through some interface that we developed. So we created this, um, um, uh, let's say interface, we call it MoCommand. It's an admittance type interface that we can create whole body movements for the arm uh, and for the base. So when the person is basically through this port of interaction, which has um, a force stroke sensor, you can create admittance interfaces and, and apply, uh, give some demonstrations uh, to the robot and the other force stroke sensor actually is is, is in charge of uh, sorry in charge of uh, identifying the and measuring the external forces. So just to give you um, uh, uh, the let's say um, a quick touch of how it is working. So when you identify the desired forces through that interface that you will see in a couple of slides, then you can um, try to make sure that the external force when you're replicating that is going as close as possible to the desired force forces by designing your impedance controllers parameters, which is KD. So at the end, you have the desired forces. You want to arrive to, ex to, to, to the certain external force, which is basically in polishing or drilling or whatever. And this is done through minimizing, uh, sorry, this formula by adjusting KD. So the optimality comes in when you're uh, identifying the KD, which is the stiffness parameter and damping parameter of the of the of during the interaction. And then you can put it in the whole body controller of the of the robot to achieve a certain task. But let me give you um, more, let's say, um, graphical illustration to make it to make it easier. So you want to provide some demonstrations, uh, simple demonstrations, that you provide desired trajectories and um, and uh, and desired forces. So here we are the once only or um, demonstrating this this through this admittance interface. And this admittance inter interface not only enables you to move the arm, but through 
uh, weighting adjustment of the whole body uh, robot, you can actually move the base as well. You can see that how nicely you can move both arm and the base to demonstrate how locomotion and manipulation behavior should look like. At the same time, through the external, um, sorry, external um, force torque sensor uh, of the robot, you can capture the desired forces, right? And through that, through optimality, let's say um, optimization that I mentioned, you can actually identify the stiffness. The learning here we are using is based on GMM, GMR, um, and then we replicate those parameters uh, with a certain level of generalizability and disturbance rejection. So if you do not only replicate the position trajectories with the uh, constant stiffness, like low stiffness and high stiffness, in low stiffness, the point is you cannot sometimes arrive to a certain desired force, and high stiffness will give you these jerky movements because the robot is really rigid, and sometimes it creates um, rigid movements. But of course, this is without any disturbance. So basically, you're replicating, a, uh, a generalizing and replicating the learned trajectories and with constant stiffness. So with the algorithm that we, 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 we show, which basically optimizes um, the stiffness to arrive to the desired force, forces, uh, you can see that the behavior of the robot is very smooth, both in locomotion and manipulation, which the, um, and, and the replication of the, of the task is quite, quite with the high performance, we have a very good tracking of force and, 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 and position. Now with low and high stiffness, if you want to also disturb the system, with the low impedance, of course, you will deviate from the desired trajectory. With high impedance, you will have high traction forces. And due to safety issues, uh, the robot will break. Uh, but with low stiffness, you cannot, again, guarantee the, 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 the achievement of the desired forces. And sometimes you even have detachment because of the, of the low uh, high compliance of the robot. But with the proposed system controller that uh, we, we developed, you can see that how nicely, even with really uh, harsh uh, disturbances of the system, you can um, track the forces, uh, even if you can see that the, 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 the equilibrium point is changing a lot. In this video, uh, you're really pushing to the, to the limits, but the force tracking is good, trajectory tracking is good, and the impedance is being optimized in real time based on the amount of forces that you're applying. So we can see this is really, really extreme. Another example of um, uh, let's say um, human robot traction control can be in uh, in co-carrying, which is really common in in in, in uh, human robot interaction tasks. But most of the co-carrying approaches are looking into um, rigid uh, object co-carrying because it's simple because you can reflect um, human forces at the robot, let's say in the vector, and use those forces and create whole body movements of the robot. But what happens when you have uh, let's say flexible or semi-deformable, let's say, objects that there's no reflection of the joint. So what you can do is create like a teleoperation scenario that you, you can move and the robot moves by looking at you, but then it will not be here. You can see that you can create forces and the robot follow you, uh, follows you, but basically this is not good enough. So we brought these, these concepts together. We created an, a new framework that you can see here that looks at the person and perceives, receives the forces all the uh, basically um, both um, let's say trajectories and forces applied by the person through the deformable and and, and uh, non-deformable objects are reflected on the robot and through some let's say uh, adaptive controller we are able to control the robot. So here the controller basically has no clue about. Um, the rigidity of the object, there's no need to mm, learn or basically monitor uh, or model the flexibility or the formability of the object. Only by looking at the person and receiving the forces, you can you will be able to perform these kind of complex tasks. We recently extended this to also, it's accepted um, and will be presented in ICRA 2023 to, to uh, box carrying. So this is an example of non-graspable, deformable um, uh, object, uh, basically that you can see also it includes multi-robot coordination and each robot is receiving the movement of the, of the person and forces reflected and you can perform some, um, some really nice task, uh, co-carrying deformable tasks like this only by moving around uh, without, so the robots basically are not pre-programmed at all and only by looking, uh, by processing that uh, those data adaptively they can, they can follow. So just let me conclude. I think it's we're running out of time. 
Um, so um, I think the message I was trying to give you, especially in, in some of the European projects that I'm coordinating, is, is that we are looking into human robot interaction from different perspectives. And most of the time, we decouple physical human robot interaction from social human robot interaction, but they are tightly interconnected. So many of the social factors and physical factors affect each other, and we cannot really exclude um, the amount of cognitive load or physical load that uh, affect one 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 on the other one. Um, this should be basically, we should start looking into uh, creating unified frameworks that bring physical factors and human factors together. And when it comes to interfaces and robotic assistance, um, we have been working a lot on um, um, personalizing these aspects and machine learning provides a very good opportunity to, to increase adaptation of the, of the robust controllers to unforeseen events or basically to tune those parameters to match them to to, to, to arrive to best performances. Um, this would be, um, uh, this can be achieved, as I mentioned, by creating uh, uh, a hybrid control approach, which you can use control or machine learning for their best performance. So this um, uh, brings me to the final um, slide. I would like to thank my lab. Uh, this is a little bit old in IIT, we are about 35 people. Uh, I acknowledge funding of the project and also, um, the other labs that um, was already mentioned, that Alessandro mentioned that I'm coordinating. I'll be happy to answer your questions if there are any, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arash, for your very interesting talk. Um, okay. I guess if someone from the audience has a question, they can simply unmute themselves or write in the chat and we can read the questions. Let's see if someone wants to break the ice. I, I can ask something. So what's your take? So lately it seems that uh, especially all these machine learning based uh, approaches seem to take over everywhere. Do you think there's some uh, fundamental component in the work that, you, that you're doing or in the application that you're looking at that cannot be taken uh, over by, you know, this deep learning approaches or in general machine learning approaches? Right, it's a very good point. I think uh, something that we have never been able to represent uh, or to justify by the use of machine learning is basically the reliability um, of the of the approach. Some um, so at the moment everything is data based. So basically the, the 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 larger the amount of data that you're providing, the deeper the convergence is in terms of machine learning. But of course, this doesn't mean that uh, you're able to foresee every unexpected, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, disturbances or variations of the model or changes of the parameters of the models. So for instance, for a robotic pick and place, you can teach a robot to carry a uh, one kilogram mass, two kilogram mass, three kilogram mass with different inertial parameters and stuff like that. But then you come up, come across an object which has, a diff let's say, not a unique or um, you unify distribution of mass or let's say inertia. So when you're rotating it around the, the, the amount of, uh, let's say uh, gravitational torque you need to apply changes and your machine learning, your learned behavior will not be valid anymore. And then you don't know what you expect from, from the robot. And imagine this robot is carrying a sharp object next to a human. And it scales to autonomous driving, it scales to driving the airplanes, it scales to autonomous, let's say, manipulators that are moving with high speed in the in the factory. So unless we are able to make these systems very robust and reliable through machine learning, of course, um, control theory has been there for hundreds of years and we have tools developed in control theory that we can make sure the systems uh, are always stable uh, they are robust to certain, let's say, variations. But in machine learning, we don't still don't have it. At some point, these 
those tools will be created for machine learning as well. So you can look at the energy of the system, how much energy you're putting, how much energy you're extracting. Until that moment, I think reliability is the most uh, biggest issue that uh, that basically uh, we are facing. Just to give you an example, if you ask ChatGPT something and ChatGPT says it wrong and you just smile, but in an industrial scenario, when the robot is holding a drill right next to you, you're not going to smile when the robot is basically kicking you with the drill head in your face. So this, these are the issues that we need to really look into it and, and expect what can be expected from machine learning. As you said, there's a big hype. I love it. And uh, what we need to know, what is the limit? So that, at the moment, I'm seeing people are doing really using machine learning for stuff that are not really recommended. So like for simple two lines of code of uh, uh, planning or control, uh, there are hours of hours of data collection and stuff like that. So uh, it's a bit not justifiable at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Hi, Virginia, good to hear from you. And uh, so it's a question. Could you elaborate a bit more about your idea and the need for a unified unified framework standardized regarding physical and cognitive loads in the streams? How could this? Um, yes. So um, by unified, I mean, of course, um, you know, not neglecting. Um, first of all, it can be not neglecting certain factors. Um, you might be providing the most amazing human robot interaction interface that minimizes the physical loads, but it might increase a lot of cognitive load. So you might uh, create a robot that moves very slowly, moves very comfortably, and you're sitting in front of the robot, but it creates a lot of frustration and it creates a lot of, let's say, probably um, attention mm, loss and, and, and stuff like that. Or you can create a very fast and productive, uh, even physically um, reliable robot, but this can be really fast and this cannot be acceptable by people, uh, create some level of anxiety. So one thing is monitoring both factors when you're introducing a technology. Uh, of course, this is the first step. And the second step is to see what is the interconnection between these elements. So um, when you're more tired, phys physically, of course, you get nervous much faster. And this, this should be considered I and mean, you can lose attention much, much uh, easier when you're physically tired. So these are also the interconnection between the two components that um, uh, I was mentioning by unified approach. So these are very quick. Uh, this, is a visit. this is a very quick feedback on your question. Yeah, sure. I also... There's another... Yeah, ah, all right. Then if you want to take the one from the chat first, uh, feel free to do so. All right. There's one question in the chat asking for, can geometric methods be used in the machine learning approach to get an estimation of the topology in which the HRI takes place and which could be used for collaborative, collaborative tasks or planning? Thank you very much. Interesting talk. You're right. So thanks, um, Mario. I think, yes. Um, I'm not sure what exactly do you mean by geometric mes methods um, that you have in mind, but if, if you maybe make it more specific. But so for collaborative task planning, we have been using a lot. I didn't talk about it. Uh, uh, a lot of machine learning tools, um, obviously, um, Simplified machine learning tools, for instance, we are using behavior trees uh, and stuff like that. We are creating those behavior trees dynamically on the fly. Um, we are also looking into the synergies of, uh, um, like also the semantics of the task, how we can combine these together to, to perform certain certain actions. I can I can uh, uh, send you a few few examples of of how we are doing this. But this has, uh, I think, machine learning there is providing a lot of. Uh, uh, amazing input in especially in high level task planning tasks if you want to um, also replicate them not only on the planning task so one example will be well, who's the best agent in doing what uh, and at the moment everything is done decided by the programmer right so when you do human robot interaction you tell the robot to do this 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 and, and the human to do that 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 so you usually um, um, this is good that to have basically the, uh, some sort of strategy or a, a, a method 
depending on the data, by considering also physical and cognitive factors of the person to to divide these actions and 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 assign it to the to the agents, like people of different capacities and robots of different capacities, of course. I hope I answered to your question, but if um, if you have had something else in mind, please write down. There was another question by Mark. Yep. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. Um, I was curious about uh, what your take is on when these type of robots will be, say, commercially available or say hit the market. And I'm I'm curious um, to just understand from the on the one hand, we have the technical challenges that need to be overcome. But if we look at industries such as self-driving cars, et cetera, we also see that there is, among others, also the regulatory um, hurdles that are to overcome. How is it in, uh, in your field? Are the requirements clearly stated as to when something could be certified, or are you working on this as well? All right. Very nice question, Mark. Thanks. So um, unfortunately, several years ago, up to like 15 years ago, when the collaborative robots were first introduced, People started worrying too much because everybody said we will put robots next to humans and they started worrying too much and, and worrying too much created so many regulations that at the moment it's it's making our lives really hard to put a robot next to a person. These worries were like, for instance, uh, a robot uh, in, the, in the close proximity to a human cannot move faster than this, acceleration should not be more than this. If you have certain inertia and if you're closer to... Um, certain body parts like head, you cannot move faster than that. But this doesn't happen when me and you work together to do something. You know, when you when you get close to me, I don't start, I don't slow down because I have a good perception of you and I have a good perception of your movements. Of course, up to a level of uncertainty, I can, I can speed up. But I, if I see that your movements are unexpected, I can slow down. So this is some sort of adjustment. So these regulations are really, really hard at the moment to, to surpass. But um, and and doesn't th 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 this makes the the buyers of the technologies a bit uncomfortable because it will reduce a lot the productivity of a company if you want to put a collaborative robot next to a human they ha they have to be certified and they have to go below a certain execution speed and this doesn't make them really happy but within a project uh, that I'm coordinating it's called Sophia with the German Standardization Institute DIN we are looking into creating new standards or new basically or contrib contributing to new standards or revising those, let's say, standards that are there. Uh, and obviously this is our uh, role to create uh, new, better perception techniques um, uh, or tools to be able to, sh to show them, say, look, uh, you can still be very fast close to humans. And um, also in autonomous driving, you can drive fast in human, let's say, where the humans exist if you have a very good perception and anticipation of the human movements. Until then, obviously, we have to make sure that uh, we are giving the giving the right message and avoiding any uh, any side, let's say, problems. If something goes wrong, then it will take other twenty years to be able to convince people that uh, self driving cars are good, the collaborative robots are safe, and and stuff like that. Perfect. But regulation is really important, Mark, as you mentioned, and this is we can provide inputs, but unfortunately, we don't have the final voice on that as researchers. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was curious because I have really no understanding of what this looks like uh, in your field, but uh, your answer helped a lot. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I guess uh, last call. Hello. I also have another question. I cannot hear you well, unfortunately. Maybe. Maybe now. Yes, much better. Okay. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you are also looking into the um, perspective of the human once you do um, mobile uh, code pairing in the sense that uh, the example that you showed, uh, the robot was uh, somehow passive, so it was like replicating and trying to help the human to do the task. But if you're also looking uh, whether the robot could take the initiative, so um, let's say teaching by demonstration, but the human side. Of course. Yes, um, we are currently working on that. And this was an extension of actually what we're doing. Obviously, uh, this comes down to, again, to the same problem of leader follower actions. You know, sometimes first we need to understand who's the leader, who's the follower, and where to how to change these, these behaviors. Um, I think the first introduction of robots um, in real use cases should be in a way that um, um, 
humans especially don't feel like they're being um, um, enslaved in a way that robots are telling humans what to do. So my, 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 my take on that is basically let's, it's the best would be to create a scenario that people think and understand that they are in, in control. So the robots are basically following, but robots are much better in many, many other, let's say, occasions, for instance, in navigation, uh, not in navigation, for instance, in, 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 you know, they can also navigate. So that, 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 that robot, we have uh, lighters that they can do easily obstacle avoidance. So what we are doing now is uh, creating one step um, more. This is a paper we recently submitted to us. So, um, uh, for instance, if a robot was semi, let's say, in a, sh in a shared autonomy, was co-carrying with a person, but instead of taking action, like avoiding an obstacle and showing the, the thing, showing the, the right way, but providing some sort of feedback to the person, like saying that, look, in that direction, you have an obstacle, you might want to avoid it. For instance, if you're carrying large boxes, uh, you might not be able to see behind you, or when you're moving with the robot, uh, the Robots are can be more aware of the situation uh, because you have other sensory, let's say, systems that can 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 provide you this. Uh, uh, then, uh, of course, um, the role allocation, task planning that I was mentioning that can that can these these can help a lot in adjusting the the variable level of autonomy that you expect from a robot to make sure that uh, how and when robots should take over. But obviously, this is very experience based. So sometimes uh, humans communicate uh, with voice. Uh, you do it, I do it. But um, these things are nice. But in industry, um, communications through voice is not very well perceived. There's a lot of noise, and there will be many robots uh, not understanding who where the comment is coming from and stuff like that. So there, the communication and the switch of the roles and stuff still is. Um, is is a big challenge to make it to make sure that this is very reliable. So it. On the control side, it's very easy to do, right? So you just make sure that the robot is doing a navigation and the person is following and vice versa. You can actually have a good spectrum of um, variable autonomy expecting from the robot. But when and how this happens and how much autonomy you give to robot or human, uh, this this is very high level. That still is a question. If, if I may um, have a follow-up question. Um, of course. The, the, thank you. Do you think the interface of a uh, robot should be like uh, implemented in order to allow this type of communication? Like you mentioned that, for example, in an industry, it might be like very noisy, but maybe light can help with that. Or of course, do you have any insight in that? So in industry, obviously, yeah, as I mentioned, of course, it depends on the field of application. But in industry, especially uh, communication through, um, through voice is not good. We'll be working a lot on augmented reality, which which helps a lot. But then it brings them variability, and variability is not very considered very much, especially with the now, even the Oculus, uh, the new version is not so, you don't want to wear it every day because, you know, it's so, we can actually, until we will have some nice glasses, um, with augmented reality, we've been able to do a lot. So basically, you can anticipate what's happening, we can control, uh, I didn't show it, but we have a really nice demonstration of, you can actually control the command and stuff like that. But there are some people that work on projecting light on the on the on the on the ground. So basically, you can give some sort of feedback from the robot to the human, uh, and from human to the robot. Of course, as I mentioned, posture has a lot of information. The haptics, uh, the touch, the forces can contain a lot of in important information that you can you can you can you can get from robot to the human. It's easy because um, you can train the person. Like red light means go slower, green light means go faster. But the other way around, um, because every human has their own way of communicating, body language uh, and stuff like that. So it needs a lot of experience and data. There, for instance, at this high level of intention tra tracking and data-driven approaches can help a lot. Because if, essentially, if something goes wrong, um, uh, lower level control will take care of it if something is really bad is going to happen. But there, for instance, um, yeah, through posture and you know, multi, let's say, sensory data, um, processing, you can say intentions go right, you know, so then you can you can give the, the lead to the robot or vice versa. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Was there another question in chat? Yes. And tactile signals used for HR communication, such as in haptic interviews by medical people, robots and, and sometimes. 
Yes, uh, Mario, we have been using a lot of tactile feedback, actually. Uh, again, I didn't talk about this. So we have, uh, if you're interested, we have uh, we recently developed a tactile wireless, um, vibro tactile sensor, we call it ErgoTac. And we used it for optimizing human posture while doing tasks, yes, that's if you want to do it more ergonomically. And we also recently used this to to adjust a certain center of pressure behavior while walking. And this seems to be, these are sensory substitution uh, sensors that instead of giving you the direct sensation of something, they give you a substitution of that. So if instead of giving it force feedback, you can adjust the level of vibration of a small uh, device, you can still give the message. It, it has some, let's say, um, learning involved, but, but tactile sensors, variable sensors, I, I believe that this is a very, very nice um, way of uh, actually uh, moving forward. Nevertheless, um, they are good for um, one or two dimensional information. So if you have a 6D planning task, for instance, if you want to communicate where the robot coin is in space with position orientation or anything else, uh, it's not going to be easy. Imagine there are six things vibrating around uh, and you don't really capture what's the point. I think tactile information is good, but for simple feedback, like simple feedback about danger, posture, change of, uh, let's say, direction and stuff like that, but not for more than two, let's say, parameters in space that you want to control. All right. Thank you very much, Arash. Um, I think you showed your contacts, your coordinates, if someone wants to reach you offline for of further questions. Uh, I would say that's all for this week. Thanks, everyone, Thank for much. joining. Thanks, everybody. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.